This is episode 51 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the life of Hereward Carrington. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode number 51. Well, we have finally made it to 10,000 downloads. Actually, we've passed that number already. And to celebrate that, I have something to give you. I'm going to uh, give you a special way to set up your podcasts. You're probably familiar with the term playlist. A playlist is a way of organizing music into a a specific kind of file so that you can listen to songs in your desired order. Well, I've put together uh, several different playlists for the podcast by category. Now, uh, you'll have to set this up on your own device. You have to do this part yourself. But once you do it, These are really clever ways to listen to the podcast. I have the Houdini episodes all listed in a timeline of when they happened approximately. Another playlist involves illusionists. Uh, Then there's a um, playlist for mentalists and the ladies of magic list and the Chautauqua performers list and the old timers 19th century performers list. It just makes a really interesting way to listen to the podcast. Of course, The lists will expand over time and new categories will come into play. For example, close-up magicians. Um, I can't currently do one of those because I only have covered one close-up magician so far on the podcast. But there are more episodes for that category to come. Now in the sad news department, I'm, I'm sure you've heard that Roy Horn, partner to the iconic Illusion duo Siegfried and Roy has passed away due to complications of the coronavirus. This is really, really tragic news. It's, it's sad on many fronts. One, this damn virus has taken another person. And two, it's taken one of the real magic heavyweight performers. You know, I was thinking about this recently, and um, the names that I looked up to when I was a kid, many of them are gone. Doug Henning. Harry Anderson, Sly Deeney, Ricciardi Jr., Harry Blackstone Jr., Norm Nielsen, Johnny Thompson, and now Roy. Mm. That is a that is a tough list right there. Uh, prayers go out to Siegfried, and uh, may the magic of Siegfried and Roy live on. So, episode 50, there was a contest, and um, I had a sneaking hunch that no one was going to get the answer correct. My fault. I took the uh, the information from an interview done by the magician in question, and that's how I knew that this guy opened for Kenny Rogers. So uh, no one got it right. One person actually wrote Harry Anderson in their answers, but he listed him among like four or five other people and then said, no, I'm going to go with this guy, and it wasn't Harry Anderson. Harry Anderson was the fellow that opened for Kenny Rogers and Dottie West um, for a a short period of time in uh, Vegas. So, because we had no winner, uh, there's going to be another Magic History Contest this week. So get ready. Get ready. This one will be a little easier to answer. The first person that sends me the correct answer will receive a piece of magic memorabilia. Here's the question. Get ready. What was the name of the magician that Doug Henning saw on the Ed Sullivan show that inspired him to become a magician? One more time. What was the name of the magician that Doug Henning saw on the Ed Sullivan show that inspired him to become a magician? So that's the question for the week. And that one's much easier than the previous one. Uh, Good luck to everybody. Send your answers to info at carnegiemagic.com. Please put contest 51 in the subject heading and put your answer in there. And the first one, the first one this time that gets it to me is the winner. 
So there is even more news uh, for the listeners of the Magic Detective podcast and the readers of the blog. You're probably aware that there's a Facebook page for the Magic Detective. Well, when I first put that up, I, you know, I didn't know any better. A Facebook page, I thought that was the way to go. But actually, what I should have put up was a Facebook group page, which is a slightly different thing. So long and short of it, I have put up a Facebook group page for the Magic Detective. First thing, just to let you know, you have to join. Um, I'm not going to turn anybody away. You just have to click the button that says I want to join. Second, anyone who's a member of the group has the ability to start a post. This is why this is a better way to go than a, than a page. And what I'm hoping for is that uh, in the future when we do uh, podcasts on various subjects that people will post uh, pictures of posters or memorabilia or props or things related to that particular magician. So that kind of it helps to enhance the particular podcast. Um, in fact, you can really post anything related to magic history in there that you like, but I'm really hoping to, to have it, um, you know, fill out the uh, podcast even more. Also, because it's a private group and you have to join to be, uh, you know, be a member, um, I, I may reveal secrets in there that I won't put on the podcast itself. It's, you know, that's, I'll think about it. Uh, at least that gives me an opportunity if there's some really cool secret um, or, you know, illusion method or something that I think would be. Um, fun for you to know, I might be able to include that in there, like I said, because it's a private group. So now how do you get there? That's a good question. It's a it's a Facebook group page. So probably the easiest thing, I'm going to spell it out for you, but probably the easiest thing is in Facebook, just go to the search box and type in Magic Detective Group, just one word, Magic Detective Group, and it should come up. But for those that want to go the long way, it's facebook.com slash groups slash magic detective group. That's that's it right there. So um, and you you're welcome to post that, by the way, is where I will put the list of the podcasts, uh, the podcast uh, playlists. I'll put those in there so you can get that as soon as you go in there. So uh, pretty cool. All right. So now today's podcast has to do with a fellow that had some run ins during his life with Harry Houdini. But he also had uh, a life of his own outside of Houdini. And I had come across a photograph of him on the cover of the Sphinx magazine. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do an article uh, or a podcast on this guy because I don't really know anything about him. So that's how we begin. Our subject today was born Harroward Hubert Lavington Carrington on October 17th, 1880 in St. Helier, Jersey, in the Channel Islands. And by the way, I'd like to stick mostly to his career as a magician. Um, I will no doubt wander a little bit into his life as a psychic investigator, Um, but I'm going to try and stick with the magic. He first became fascinated with magic in his youth at the age of 13, which would be about 1893. He gave his first a magic show for a hospital charity in New York City. He'd not been in the U.S. very long before this time, so his interest in magic started when he was living in England. And I have seen him reference Professor Hoffman's Modern Magic in several of his own books on magic, so this was obviously a periodical that he favored greatly. By 1899, he was knowledgeable enough in magic to be submitting articles to Mahatma magazine, The first time he appeared in Mahatma Magazine was with a trick that he called the Magic Flower Pot. One thing I found fascinating comes from a 10-year-old David Verner, later to be known as Di Vernon. He frequented the Ottawa Library, often looking for articles on magic. Many of these articles that he found were written by Hereward Carrington and were featured in the pages of Scientific American Magazine. So Carrington had a long history with the magazine long before the Marjorie years, and his articles were instrumental in informing a young Vernon about magic and its history. 1908 was an interesting year for Carrington. 
But before I can go into that, I have to shift gears and talk about Giuseppe Palladino. She was an Italian spiritualist and psychic medium. She was setting the world on fire with her apparent supernatural manifestations. She could apparently cause tables to float in the air. She could speak to the dead and cause objects to move without touching them. These are among a few things she could apparently do. It appears her career began in Poland in 1893 when she began to hold seances and produce these unusual effects. She was a sensation very quickly. But by the time she arrived in England in 1895, she was already being called out as a fraud. But not just any fraud. Sir Oliver Lodge said of her, it must have needed long practice to bring to it its present level of skill. That is a very revealing quote. Now, what isn't talked about is that her first husband was a traveling magician and even had his own shop. So, I wonder where Eusepia obtained her skill, hmm? She continued to tour Europe and continued to be exposed. John Neville Maskelyne even got involved in the exposure at one point. With all of these exposures, you'd think she would just vanish into the night. Not so. She got more and more popular. And that's where Carrington comes in. In 1908, he went to Italy to see Palandino. He was part of a committee appointed by the Society of Physical Research. Carrington was already an investigator for the American Society of Physical Research. He, along with two others, went to investigate Palandino. Their findings were rather unique. Each member of the three-person committee caught her in cheating. But there were other things she did they thought were of a supernatural nature. In 1909, Carrington brought Palandino to America. He acted as her manager and set up a tour across the country. She would put on seances for the wealthy and the scientific community. Howard Thurston, the great magician, attended one of her seances and felt her to be totally genuine. So much for the theory that magicians could see through the tricks of mediums. Though, in truth, magicians were the best equipped to discover her methods. I just find it terribly questionable that you'd have a medium who'd already been exposed for fraud and you bring her to the U.S. and parade her around. Incidentally, the magicians who exposed her are like a who's who of magic history. Perhaps Ken Silverman in the biography of Houdini, has a glimpse into why she was so popular. The book reads, For invoking wonderment, she equaled or outdid the great magicians of the period. Her seances were raucous, erotic, exhausting. While examiners held her hands and her feet, disembodied spirits felt, tickled, and kissed the sitters pinched their ears, pulled their hair, tables fell over, curtains bulged and shook and sparkled, and human silhouettes appeared. Okay, I get it. Who wouldn't want to see that? that <laughs> that's pretty wild. I mentioned this earlier, but Carrington appears on the cover of the October 1913 issue of the Sphinx magazine. Here's what Dr. A.M. Wilson had to say about Carrington in the issue. Here Ward Carrington, author, investigator, inventor, and with possible exception of Daniel P. Abbott, the best posted man and the most expert demonstrator of spiritualistic phenomena in this country or any country. Mr. Carrington is the author of many important works on psychology, spiritualism, and kindred subjects. He brought Eusepia Palandino to this country and thus made possible the investigation of the most noted medium of modern times. Mr. Carrington is the author and compiler of three books which I have in active preparation and which will be ready for sale in a few weeks. I am proud of the friendship Mr. Carrington and of his friendship with the Sphinx. The picture on the cover shows Mr. Carrington in his handcuff release. Now, there's a lot here. First off, um, the mention of Daniel P. Abbott should actually read David P. Abbott, the famous amateur magician from Omaha who wrote the books of mystery. Uh, next is the handcuff release on the cover. Uh, now, get this. In January 1911, 
um, in the Sphinx, they mentioned that Carrington had just wrote exposés in the Scientific American magazine uh, December 10th and December 17th with exposés in handcuffs and escapes and also an expose on sacks, bags, boxes, trunks, milk cans, packing cases, and escapes from therein. I wonder what Miller, Wilcox, Cunning, Houdini, Hardeen, and other escape artists of the time thought of Carrington's work. That's what it said in the Sphinx. To follow up, I don't think those exposés bothered Houdini in the least. Carrington included these articles in some of his future magic books. Finally, there is a mention that Carrington was the most expert demonstrator of spiritualistic phenomena in this country or any other country. He further mentions that he brought Palandino to America. Clearly, Carrington has set himself up as an authority, and he obviously was, and had written books on the subject, both pro and con. Though I wonder at times if parading around a fraudulent medium has more to do with his own celebrity advancement than for hers. Carrington wrote The Boy's Book of Magic in 1920. In the preface of the book, he writes, I wish to acknowledge here my great indebtedness to Frederick Keating for valuable assistance in the preparation of the book and for furnishing me with several original slights, also to Messrs. Howard Thurston, Harry Houdini, and Harry Keller for valuable suggestions. Within the book are chapters on escapes, directly related to the articles that appear in, in the Scientific American magazine, except in this book, Houdini's image also appears within and Harry is credited with much of the information. That's interesting. Now, in 1924, we have the biggest event in Hereward Carrington's life. He meets Mina Crandon. She is known as Marjorie the Medium, and he is part of a committee that set out to investigate her claims of mediumship. This is done under the auspices of the Scientific American magazine. Carrington, of course, has a long history with the magazine, both as a columnist and now with his credentials as an investigator of physical research, or in other words, his psychic investigator. In the pages of The Witch of Lime Street, it says that the Crandons didn't like speaking to the press, but rather they preferred Hereward Carrington to do the talking for them. This is the most curious thing. You see, Carrington lived with the Crandons during the whole Marjorie the Medium investigation. Was he just a house guest, or was he more? In the book, The Psychic Mafia, by Lamar Keene, it says, One researcher, Paul Tabori, reports as fact that Hereward Carrington, a noted investigator who brought in a favorable verdict on Marjorie's mediumship, had a sexual affair with her. I should also note that Carrington had already made up his mind on Marjorie before Houdini ever entered the picture. The Scientific American magazine conducted 30 seances with Marjorie before Houdini ever found out. Malcolm Byrd, who was the secretary of the group and the one charged with contacting Houdini, said he didn't do it because Houdini was on tour. The reality was, though, Byrd and Houdini did not get along and had previous run-ins. It was just easier keeping Houdini out of the loop. Apparently, at some point, Bird also became a house guest to the Crandons, and apparently he also has an affair with Marjorie as well. Well, Houdini does find out about Marjorie and the Scientific American seances, so he makes arrangements for a series of new seances that he can attend. And again, from the Silverman book, we have this. Having arrived in Boston, Houdini dined with the always hospitable Crandons, but stayed at the Copley Plaza Hotel. It is not possible to stop at one's house, Houdini explained, break bread with him frequently, then investigate him and render an impartial verdict. That's eye-opening. The Silverman biography of Houdini says, 
Hereward Carrington, the physical researcher and amateur magician, stood steady to endorse Marjorie as genuine, felt no need to attend the further seances. That latter part meant he was convinced Marjorie was the real deal by the time Houdini got involved. After Houdini's first exposure to Marjorie, the first seance he attended with her, he too was offered a room to stay in. But Houdini refused and was driven home. Houdini knew that one of Marjorie's charms was her sex appeal. This was used on Carrington, and one of the very reasons he lived with the Crandons for so long, a fringe benefit for helping Marjorie to have successful seances. It seemed when Carrington was present, her seances were successful. When Houdini was there and Carrington was not, nothing significant happened. After Houdini attends several seances in August 1924, he's back on tour. No official statement from the Scientific American Magazine Committee is forthcoming, but Houdini wants to take matters into his own hands. He contacts Dr. Walter Franklin Prince, one of the original members of the committee, and suggests that they throw Hereward Carrington out. Again, according to the Silverman bio, He, Houdini, believed that Carrington, like Bird, a frequent house guest of the Crandons, had helped Marjorie fake her manifestations and feared being found out. Houdini and Carrington had known each other previously. In fact, Carrington had been to Houdini's home, but now they were more adversaries than friends. Words between them flared in the press. On page 106 of The Witch of Lime Street by David Jayer, there's a photo depicting the judges from the Marjorie the Medium uh, trials, if you can call them that. Houdini's name and photo is in the center. The other four pictures and names are in the four corners. All these other four pictures are listed as doctors. The only one that isn't listed as a doctor is Houdini. Houdini called into question the authenticity of Carrington's Ph.D. Now, from what I can find, Carrington received his Ph.D. from Oskaloosa College in 1918, except Oskaloosa College graduated its final class in 1898. It then moved to Des Moines and became Drake College. But Carrington said he went to Oskaloosa College. Now, from 1902 to 1916, the buildings for the old Oskaloosa College became the Iowa Christian College, but it, too, ended before Carrington claimed to have been graduated there in 1918. From the Silverman bio on Houdini, we find this. But before long, Houdini was proclaiming that Carrington had purchased a phony Ph.D. degree for $75 in Oskaloosa. And I'm wondering if... Houdini was not correct. I think he was. In the end, Carrington stayed on the committee. His conclusion, Marjorie exhibited supernatural abilities. Houdini's conclusion, exactly the opposite. The Scientific American magazine did not award Marjorie the prize for being a legitimate medium. In March 1929, Carrington starts to manage the Algerian hypnotist Libero, He was a man who hypnotized lions, crocodiles, and snakes. In fact, he would go on, Carrington, would go on to manage a number of these unusual entertainers. At some point, he had a weekly radio show called Who Knows that appeared every Friday evening, and he continued to keep his feet in the magic pool. In January 1957, he submitted a trick called Silent Telepathy to Genie Magazine. In May of 1958, he submitted a routine called Spirit to Genie Magazine. During his lifetime, Carrington wrote many books on spiritualism, fake mediums, magic, and even dieting. He was certainly a very gifted and prolific writer. December 26, 1958, Hereward Carrington died in Los Angeles, California. His seminal work on spirits, that's best for magicians, is a book called The Physical Phenomenon, of the spiritualist. He covered the trick methods used by spiritualists. Carrington appears to be highly respected among those in the psychic investigator worlds and indeed may have been the first of its kind. He searched out mediums, seances, clairvoyance, haunted houses, and more. 
In Magic, he was a lesser player, but due to his big shining moment in the sun with Marjorie and Houdini, we still recall his name. Once again, keep in mind I tried to stick to mostly the Magic side where Carrington was concerned, and I hope I gave this uh, subject his just due. He really deserves a much more extensive biography, and there is a man that has begun that process, Steve Rivkin from Washington, D.C. area. Uh, he has a great blog on Carrington with some pictures of, of uh, Carrington's magic props, and I'll add the link to uh, Steve's blog in the uh, description for this episode. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. If you like this podcast, please use whatever method your podcast provider gives you to like the podcast. Also, if you're listening on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, consider giving me a five-star review if you think the podcast is worth it. And don't forget to check out the new Facebook group page at facebook.com slash groups slash magic detective group and feel free to post uh, anything magic related in there and um, hopefully we can get kind of a community going one of the things i did i have learned about facebook is they are really concerned with engagement so the more i know we have uh, a lot of fans of the podcast so if you guys can uh, guys and girls can go in there and just have fun post pictures of uh of magic props that might relate to one of the particular episodes and uh, let's get a dialogue going and have a lot of fun there in the magic detective group and that's going to do it for this episode of the magic detective podcast my name is dean carnegie i am the magic detective thank you for listening please have a great week and stay safe